Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to Congregation of God's People on this second Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to Rutgers Presbyterian Church, Church of Open Commensality, which means an open embrace to everyone regardless of your age, race, gender, orientation, or any other human distinction. You are welcome here. Welcome also for the service at the end of which we will have an inurment of our dear friend and choir member, uh, David Calso. Uh, and welcome to his family here among us. Welcome to those handful of faithful Presbyterians exhausted probably after last <laughs> Sunday when we had a um, confirmation and filled the church a little better. Uh, it's marvelous to uh, have you with us. Uh, there are also other announcements. You probably noticed that we rearranged the pews, taking some of them out uh, so that there is more space. And we are doing a remodeling of our audiovisual uh, setup. Uh, so this is the first Sunday where we are not testing a new one. We are just having an stopgap situation, as you see. We have here a folding table full of electronics and our guys are right behind it. Uh, I'm not speaking through the speakers, I don't think. I'm actually speaking only through this. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. You see all those hanging wires here and so on. So yes, that's, that can happen. And don't be alarmed. Uh, so the situation is that we are growing, we are getting better, and that is that occasionally we need to make these allowances for that. And uh, those are just a few announcements at the beginning of the service. Uh, I'm asking your patience with that new setup. And uh, at the beginning of the service, I greet you with the apostolic greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please join me now for the call to worship. We will read responsibly. O oh God, we wait, and our waiting is for you. O oh God, we long, and our longing is for you. O oh God, we yearn, and our yearning is for you. And in our waiting, we listen for your presence. And in our longing, we hear our names. And in our yearning, we are found.
And now, dear friends, please join me in our prayer of confession. Forgive us, God, when we imagine you are present only in spectacular events of miraculous nature. May we find you speaking to us in gentle drops of rain on leaves of trees, in the chirping and popping of a sparrow, in sparks of laughter in the eyes of a child. Forgive us, God, when we believe that you, your presence is to be heard only in the thunder. May we, May we hear you speaking to us in the voices of our friends, in the silence of the lonely, in the beauty and harmony of music. Forgive us, God, when we think only obscure religious dogmas and elaborate rituals capture who you are. May we be willing to find you in the relationships of mutual love, in the care for tiny creatures and grand oceans, in the lure for harmony and justice. Now, if you are able, please stand for the words of assurance. Hear the words of assurance. Live the fullness of life each day. Opening our eyes to God's loving presence. Love boldly in the everyday. Finding God in the heart of justice. Listen in the world. Hearing assurance of forgiveness. Now, having heard the words of assurance about the divine grace, now let us reach to one another with greeting of peace. Peace of Christ be with you. And we can include into it our dear friend, uh, Ulla, who is in Finland. So it is really intercontinental <laughs> peace of Christ now going to everyone. Peace of Christ. Peace, peace of Christ Lord. be with you. Peace. Peace be with you all. Peace to all. Peace to that. Peace everyone. Peace with everyone. Peace. Peace everyone. Peace. Peace to all. Even though I don't see any children here, we still do the children message. And because we are all children, it's Father's Day, by the way. So, yes. Uh, there might be children online, and we can still learn like children. And today I want to talk to you about the Day of Atonement as it is in the Bible. Among our Jewish friends, it is called Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And they are not keeping it exactly like it is in the Hebrew Bible because there is no temple any longer. So they needed, like with Pentecost or uh, Passover or Shavuot and all these other big hol holidays, 
they needed to rearrange it. But in the Hebrew Bible, they had very interesting ritual, which is behind one specific word in English, which I think was derived from this ritual, was coined, was developed by the translators of the Bible for translating this specific ritual, but is understood completely differently these days. I have here two goats. So do you see it? Yeah. And here is another goat. And now we will have an one is to be offered to the Lord as a sacrifice, and one is to be offered to Azazel, which was like a demon of the desert or wild places. And we need to have a lottery for that because there has to be a lot cast between these two who is going for whom. You know, don't be deceived by the color. You know, like this going to uh, Azazel and white going to, no, 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 no. It, there needs to be an, and I'm looking, I prearrange with Christine, but I will actually go down to aisle. I'll, I'll try to have a in, invite, pull in the congregation into it. And I have here stones, that, that was the way they did the casting of the lots in the Bible. One is Urim, most likely the white one, and Tumim, the dark one. And I will ask someone to draw the, draw the lot for this one, goat. And I'm going to have this. Normally, I should have an ephod, but I'm not a priest of Hebrew order. That it'll be like a big pocket on a chest. And I will rattle it and reach in and take out the stone. But I will ask someone here who will be the drawer of the lot for the black one black gold. Yes, yeah, fine, so. Good. So, you see, it is going to go to be to the Lord, to God, while this one is going to go to Azazel, the demon of the wilder, wild places. Now, I need to do it kind of sanitized. So we'll take this and <laughs> has been offered to the Lord, <laughs> okay? <laughs> that means that poor black guy is not any longer. But here we have the one for the Azazel. And the ritual was that now I will go around, look around, and probably ask around, and we will have a liturgy where I will put my hands on this goat and confess all the sins and guilts and other transgressions we did as a community or individuals. Imagine, like driving too fast will be for me. <laughs> and uh, not always making uh, tea for my dear wife while I'm making coffee for myself. And uh, those are jokes, but there are serious offenses I committed and I'm not going to share them with you like you are not sharing with me yours right now. But that ritual will be like that. We will put all that guilt on this goat and then it'll be a scapegoat. That's the name of scapegoat. 
And what we all do with that scapegoat, what do you hear in it? A scapegoat. A scapegoat. It'll be driven out. It'll actually live. In the wilderness, you know, we'll have to be clever, but on the other hand, that is that kind of very interesting thing with scapegoats in the Bible. Scapegoats in the Bible, they survive and they carry that burden of guilt with them. But the community, the dwelling places, all of that is taken away from the dwelling places and from the community. And that is the reason for scapegoats. We will keep scapegoat here. But it was like a reminder that we don't offer our guilts to God, but we have them removed. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. They are driven away. I, I can move it further, like here. Yeah, you need to stay behind the speaker and we will stay behind the speaker from now on. Uh, so here is the scapegoat which is carrying away the guilt. They are not offered, they are purged that way, away from habitable areas. And that is a reminder that we need to confess, we need to fast, we need to set up the proper behaviors among ourselves so that we can live in harmony. And that is the meaning of that ritual. And to a large extent is practiced in Yom Kippur, which is the time when people come to themselves, think of their guilt, Think of the way they can fix it, reach out to their neighbors, friends, or enemies, and set the scores right. Being reminded, not any longer by physical goat, but being reminded by that ancient ritual of scapegoat. And with that, let us have a prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for reminding us that we carry the baggage on our shoulders of our misdeeds and mistakes and sins. And that there is a reason to confess and to amend, to change and to ask pardon. We thank you that we know it is possible to get rid of that baggage and that you are gracious and loving and receiving people back like a father of a prodigal son.
Our scripture lesson today is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 23 through the first part of 25. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. So ends the reading from the living word. So dear friends, uh, we continue uh, our series of worships uh, about uh, five fundamentals and how to overcome the darkness which they represent. Uh, this time, we will be, of course, talking about uh, substitutionary atonement. That was, I think, the penultimate, uh, penultimate uh, fundamental in that arrangement which started 100 years ago or a little earlier than that. And when I say substitutionary atonement, I need to explain it probably a little, uh, especially for liberal Christians. Uh, because in our own church, we don't believe that. But there are many people who do. So it goes roughly this way. Sinful people gravely offended God by the original sin, which is then carried on from generation to generation, but added to by misdeeds and sins of people ever since. As a result, everyone deserves death sentence. The only way of reconciliation with God was through sacrifice. Jesus therefore stepped in and offered himself either as a substitution or as a sacrifice to God. Thus, in Jesus' death, in his blood, divine wrath was satisfied and sinful people were reconciled to God. And dear friends, let me say right away that this is, when you think about it, and we'll think about it in a moment, this is quite atrociously bad theology. And theology here, I mean teaching about God. John Dominic Crossan, an American theologian, calls it a crime against divinity, a criminal slander of God. It is utterly unbiblical and betrays great misunderstanding of ancient and modern concepts of sacrifice. And above it all, it is dangerous for our own spiritual, psychological, and communal well-being. It is so widespread and so thoroughly bad that it is difficult to even know where to start. And I'll have to kind of focus on three aspects of it. First, I will try to show and also show what might be an alternative, but to show that it is a crime against God. Secondly, that it is not biblical. And thirdly, it is indeed quite dangerous. And we will start with this crime against God. As much as it seems this uh, substitutionary atonement that Jesus' uh, Jesus's blood paid for our sins, ubiquitous in church and in a society, the way society views Christians, in a church, just open even our new modern hymnal, and they try their best to kind of weed it out, but it is almost impossible. 
And that is the constant struggle because some hymns are just steeped in this theology. Or devotionals, daily readings and so on. Very often it sneaks in. And it is present even in the secular society, in encyclopedias. We claim like this, and I'm here quoting, uh, that this substitutionary atonement is a central concept within Christian theology. Just give me a break. You know how they are, again, like under that spell of conservative Christianity and applying it to all Christians. In fact, as much as it seems to be there for, from ever, this doctrine is a relative newcomer. And here I have to speak as an European. Uh, from American perspective, it's ancient, okay? But no, it's not ancient, it's medieval. Uh, I know that medieval sounds for Americans like really ancient, but it's not. Uh, it goes back to dark ages and feudal worldview and big guy in this theory or in this ideology or in this theology was Anselm of Canterbury. And it is perfectly distilled in his book, Cur Deus Homo, why God became human. He lived in 11th century. And that is where this was really fully formed. Jesus' death on the cross was absolutely necessary because there was no other way in which sinful people could have been reconciled with God. God's righteousness was offended by human sin and demanded satisfaction. Sin could not be simply forgiven because that would undermine the divine honor and divine order in the world. Someone had to die for it. And that someone ended up of being Jesus' perfect substitute because he was both human and divine. This is completely informed, if you paid attention to the, this rephrasing by Anselm of Canterbury, it is completely informed by feudal worldview. There is this offense, demand of satisfaction, there is behind the logic of hierarchy, honor, and order. In this doctrine, God is like a supreme feudal lord demanding satisfaction like some offended, bloodthirsty tyrant, come what may and come from wherever it may. Yes, in the Bible you come across God being sometimes angry or punishing but in this medieval dogma, it is made into the central feature. God vindictive, blood, bloodthirsty, feudal monster, unwilling or unable even, if followed really, to forgive, unable to forgive. It is a build on the logic of collective guilt also, something we abandoned, I, one would hope, long time ago and mechanical punishment. The offense must be punished no matter who pays for it, whether guilty or innocent. Friends, that is a good reason there why that period of human history was called Dark Ages. This is the theological and religious manifestation of it. And it's a great shame to realize how popular it is still among some Christians and in America. I really never understood. This was born in a scholastic period of Catholicism. How could it be so popular among American Protestants? 
it is also unchristian. Don't we hear about God be, being the love manifest? God is love, and who dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him, quoting John's theology. About God loving us unconditionally like mother in, from Isaiah. About a prodigal son being welcomed and forgiven without reservation. God, on the, of this dogma of substitutionary atonement, is the exact opposite when you think about it, what I just described and showed from the Bible. God of this dogma is not biblical. And that takes me to that second part I mentioned, to show that this dogma of substitutionary atonement is not biblical. It's not. In our biblical reading from Romans, we hear Paul comparing Jesus' death to sacrifice. It is there. And thank you for reading it so clearly, Christine. It is one passage about of other five sprinkled through the New Testament, which are used to support this substitutionary atonement and sacrifice of Christ. On the surface, it sounds like that. But if you look closer, it cannot be sustained. First of all, there are many hapax legomena. I need to explain, hapax legomena. <laughs> Good, Christine is giving me a uh, look. Uh, hapax legomena are, the, that's a technical term from theology or exegesis, and it means that those are the words in the person's writing which are used only once. So imagine that we read all the Christine's articles about health and uh, advocacy and, and so on uh, through her career. And then there we will discover in one article, in one paragraph, in that paragraph, there'll be like five or six words which never ever appear anywhere else in her writing, ever. It must have been my editor. That was your, <laughs> exactly. Or there is another option, but not in modern uh, journalism, but that in, in ancient times, it is actually another option, and that is that uh, it's a quotation unacknowledged quotation. These days you will probably acknowledge that, you know, here I'm quoting so and so, or the, the, as I heard from, or direct quotation uh, and so on. But back then that, that this was most likely a quotation. So that's one thing. It's probably quotation or he is quoting from some kind of a liturgy. It's not his own thinking. It, he is applying that in his own way. But Paul is not writing Dogma, he is using it metaphorically. It is a parable, it is a similitude, not to be taken literally made into a dogma. All his listeners and readers, and here we can take the logic of it, all his listeners and readers would instantly recognize this. Because all people back then, Jews as well as pagans, or those who used to be pagans and are now sitting in the churches, they're familiar with the real sacrifices and their theory or theology of real sacrifices. And so that they would know that the guilty party offered sacrifice to the injured deity. Sometimes the sacrifice could be offered on behalf of a friend, say, you know, or on behalf of the community. But it was a human agent offering, offering to God, giving offering to God. But never ever could a deity sacrifice to himself. And even among the polytheists, and that's, part of my academic background, uh, ancient uh, polytheistic religions, even among the polytheists, 
when deities are giving each other something, those are not sacrifices, those are gifts, never sacrifices. God does not sacrifice his son to himself, putting aside human sacrifice, which was taboo, you know, and nothing to be touched for centuries by that time. People knew it could not be taken literally, therefore. They knew this is a similitude, this is a metaphor, this is a parable. And our passage from Romans is quite instructive here with that. Its vocabulary is from sacrifices. It is using Greek words for sacrifices. But the meanings of those words all point towards something else. That is that, that Paul probably picked up this particular quotation, most likely, because it was filled with these words which were pointing towards divine mercy, towards divine forgiveness, towards release of slaves from bondage or people from their sins. They showed that the law was abandoned with preference for forgiveness and for healed relationships. Here I had one page of that uh, list of the English translation, Greek word, and then explaining why it is so. I will spare you that. That is actually the meaning of English word for atonement, what we just described. It was coined when they were translating King James Version. And at one moment, it means being in harmony. Atonement is at one moment. At one moment. Atonement. It's collided, collapsed this way. Restoring relationship. Community between humans and between humans and God. The sacrifice is a parable pointing towards the liberation of slaves and healing of relationships. That is in the center of that. And now you see how different it is from this substitutionary atonement where there is this dark deity demanding satisfaction. Finally, this dogma of substitutionary atonement is inhumane and dangerous for all of us. This ideology of merciless God who resembles medieval tyrant, dear friends, it has consequences. Minds infected with the medieval dogma also gravitate towards medieval dark age solutions to troubles in a society. And there is a close correlation between belief in a harsh, punishing God who is unable to forgive and who demands that guilty party be paid in blood, the guilt be paid in blood on one side, and on the other side, for instance, in our society, those laws, three strike laws, you know, you do three times, and with the third time, you are jailed or in prison forever or substantially long. Or minimal sentencing laws, as if we did not have judges well-educated and well-framed, at least one would hope, if they are not ideological appointees. And we are curtailing their freedom and their imagination and their judicial thinking by giving them minimal sentencing laws 
prescribing for them, as if the, just downgrading them almost into automata. You know, they, they receive this, jury returns, then he or she, as a judge, does not need to think about uh, all the framing, all the co context, just it is prescribed, so does that automatically. That is so dark aged. And uh, an overlay, a map of Christian fundamentalism in our nation with a map of death penalty, friends, in the last decade, say, and you get almost, almost perfect match. Christian fundamentalism and death penalty, done. And they overlap. All of that can lead us to despair. But friends, if this dark religious ideology can be can teach people in this sinister way, it also means it can be untaught. It can be untaught. People can unlearn dark religion. And by the way, that is why progressive Christians are not so scared by secularism because when you think about it, secularism is often indeed our natural ally. And people also can learn about tolerant, loving, and forgiving God. So we do not need to despair especially because we know that God is not a medieval tyrant. We can give many examples from our own lives. And we can become examples ourselves going forward. God is gracious and merciful, like a loving parent loving us unconditionally, taking assurance from it and living it out openly, boldly, and proudly. That is the way we can help those around us to abandon that dark medieval theology and step into something brighter and better. And frankly, friends, at least sociologically, it is already happening. Take heart, it is happening. Because sociologists are telling us that the younger generation among evangelicals and fundamentalists are taking it differently. They are more, for instance, because that is measurable. You can ask easily about it. They are more against capital punishment, for instance. So there are changes happening. And I think that they are happening partly because they are built on different theology. This is happier, more, more hopeful form of faith which builds a new community of free and joyful believers. True atonement, at one man, in harmony with one another, and with, in harmony and assured of divine love and grace. Amen. And now I will ask you if you are able to stand for affirmation of faith, which is taken from confession of the Presbyterian Church of 1967. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness 
but God reveals divine love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful people. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's divine love. information pre-recorded. Hi, my name is Jackie Shornstein Capilouto and I'm a philanthropy officer at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share what's happening in the fight for reproductive health care and abortion access. The fight for reproductive freedom is at a moment of crisis. The U.S. Supreme Court is poised to overturn the federal protections of Roe v. Wade. The consequences of this decision will be swift and devastating for patients seeking essential health care nationwide. 26 states will quickly move to ban abortion, including 13 states with trigger laws that could go into effect shortly following the decision, if not immediately. 36 million women, nearly half of the women of reproductive age in the United States, and more people who can become pregnant could soon lose access to abortion in their state. We've already seen a preview of this impact on patients and providers in Texas and now in Oklahoma. Even people in states with protections for abortion will face overextended health centers and staff who are facing a surge of out-of-state patients. Roe v. Wade being overturned and the decades-long campaign to undermine it is and will be felt disproportionately by Black and Indigenous people, communities of color, undocumented people, people living with low incomes, and people in rural areas, communities who have long faced barriers to abortion access due to systemic barriers and discrimination. In the midst of this crisis moment, Planned Parenthood and our partners are prepared to fight back. We will think bigger and bolder to build the world we want, in which everyone can access the care they need, no matter what. We have been preparing for this moment for many years. As our reproductive justice allies have taught us, Rose protections were never enough. They were the floor, not the ceiling. Abortion access has been out of reach for far too many people. 
We are working to build a healthcare infrastructure that is grounded in equity, that centers the people who are most marginalized by systemic racism, and aims to ensure they have access to abortion care. We know that when we focus on removing obstacles for those who face the greatest barriers to healthcare, we all will benefit. To meet the immediate needs of patients, PPFA is working in deep partnership with Planned Parenthood affiliates, partner organizations across the country, and the Biden-Harris administration to think creatively and provide critical resources to ensure access to care, even if it means crossing state lines. We have prepared to meet the moment in a number of ways, including supporting our Planned Parenthood affiliates, patient navigator programs, and patient assistance funds, who work closely with patients to find and schedule an appointment, as well as help secure funding for travel, lodging, and care as needed, increasing access to telehealth and telemedicine abortion, assisting Planned Parenthood affiliates that are working to build or expand health centers close to state borders and airports, and assessing the feasibility of mobile vans to deliver care, working to license abortion providers in multiple states, and advertising critical patient reassurance information and education, making it clear that patients can still contact us for help and making sure that they understand there are clear and legal paths to abortion care in other states. On the legal side, Planned Parenthood is exploring where we can file challenges to restrictive laws in state court and using state constitutions as the basis for protecting our right to abortion. I know this is a lot of information and you might be asking yourself what you can do at this moment. Some actions include giving to Planned Parenthood Federation of America, Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, or Planned Parenthood advocacy organizations, supporting local abortion funds through the National Network of Abortion Funds, who, in collaboration with Planned Parenthood organizations, will be providing direct resources to patients who need support and access to abortion, and donating to independent providers through the Abortion Care Network. Thank you so much for your support and for this opportunity to join you today to share what's at stake with members of your community. It's been an honor and we are so grateful to the Peace and Justice Social Committee for highlighting Planned Parenthood's essential work. Now I uh, invite you to partake in the presentation of tithes and offerings. If you would like to make a contribution to Rutgers Presbyterian Church, please consider mailing in a check to the church office, or if you prefer to pay online, please consult the instructions found in our weekly emails or the PDF of the bulletin. And if you are worshiping here in the sanctuary and you haven't availed yourself of any of these options, there is a basket uh, in the narthex plates where you can leave um, the narthex being that little room back there um, where you can leave your donation. Thank you. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your gifts of compassion and mercy. Now we offer our gifts, gifts of time, talent, effort, and treasure. Our gifts are not flashy or perfect, but the gifts that we pray may reflect your compassion and mercy to the hurting world. few announcements. Uh, summer is upon us and we are uh, heading closer to summer schedule. Uh, but 
Today, after surveys, roughly around 12.30, either in the session room or on Zoom, the same Zoom link like it is uh, for worship, we will have a theological discussion or discussion about the politics and all of that like we used to have when we were completely online. And so please feel free to either join me in the session room or uh, stay on Zoom for that if you are. It's in place of a Bible class which we discontin discontinued for summer. Uh, on Tuesday, there is a resistance bureau at six o'clock, and on Thursday, uh, our meal program at six o'clock here, where we are serving about 90 meals. Uh, next Sunday, uh, there are choir rehearsal and change. Sunday school for at least summer will be meeting at 10 o'clock. So Sunday school from next Sunday will be at 10 o'clock, both in person on in the session room again, or on Zoom. Please note, we are returning to 10 o'clock. Worship will be again Pride Sunday service at 11 o'clock, uh, on Zoom, live stream, and in person and again, theological discussion afterwards uh, in the session room and on Zoom. Now, we proceed to intercessory prayers, our intercessions. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you can respond, hear our prayers. And when, Lord, in thanksgiving, the response is the same. Let us be in prayer. God, we know you are kind and loving, gracious and slow to anger. Hear us as we pray for our sisters and brothers all over the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those we know who are suffering in heart, mind, body, and spirit. We pray for those who are near to us and are homebound. And we pray also for those who are distant. We pray for continuous healing, for our friend Denise. We pray for Albert Kimborough. We pray for all those who are recovering from surgeries or preparing for some. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. As we celebrate the Juneteenth and the resilience and resistance of black and colored communities, we give thanks for their witness and their strength. Lord, in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. We also remember that it took year, years from Emancipation Proclamation till Juneteenth in some parts of this nation. And even three months from the end of Civil War until Juneteenth. And another year until it was sealed in Constitution. It's a source of shame also. And so we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the nature. We pray for the climate suffering from our selfishness and pollution. We pray for all those struck by the disasters around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our leaders that they may act wisely. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We ask your presence to be in all the places around the world where there is a conflict and a war, remembering first Ukraine, then Sri Lanka, Myanmar, the western part of China, or other places where people are oppressed for their belief, for their faith, their religion, for their race, or any other way. We ask, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for ourselves and our needs that we too might seek wisdom and follow your leading in reaching out, finding an harmony with our friends and enemies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We are giving thanks for our fathers and grandfathers today and for all the fatherly figures in our lives. For many of us, they were true loving caregivers. Lord, in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. May we open ourselves to atonement, being in harmony with one another in our community and with you, our God, today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. God is here among us, and we give thanks to God for that. Lord, in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. And now together, we say the prayer. God, heart of the world, revealed through the every aspect of creation, understood through our awareness, may we honor the holiness of creation and act accordingly, so that your love is reflected in the way we live. May we always be thankful for the food we eat and the friends we have. May we forgive those who have hurt us and be forgiven for the hurts we have given. In the freedom of love, may we live as your heartbeat and not be compromised by hesitation. Through our freedom, may your justice be seen and heard and experienced now and forever. Amen.
friends, now we continue uh, our service with an ermant of our dear friend and a choir member, as I indicated at the beginning of the service, uh, David Kelso. And uh, for that, uh, here are first scripture sentences from John. There Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let us pray. Dear loving Lord, we thank you for David and his life. We thank you for the gift he shared with us, his life, his talent, his music always larger than life. His love of purple, his rainbow songs, now joining the choir invisible, yet still profound in praise. May he now find rest in your loving embrace as his remains will stay here in this church. Amen. Now in a sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we command to Almighty God our brother David and we commit his ashes to their resting place. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, says the Spirit. They rest from their labors, and their works follow them. And now, dear friends, let us all here appropriate, that means take within you and take with you to your ongoing days the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord shower you with favor and give you peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.